Thank you for coming. So what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon is uh, um, a collection of diseases called interstitial lung disease. So it's a pretty difficult topic to digest, um, even for us doctors, um, patients. Um, you know, when we were medical students, whenever it was about interstitial lung disease, we were always very challenged. And it's probably why I became a pulmon pulmonologist, because I always wanted the challenge. So, um, so interstitial lung disease, what is it? So basically, interstitial refers to the term interstitium. So interstitium is a part of in the lung. Um, so basically, the lung tissue is composed of air sacs or alveoli, okay? So this, these little network of uh, capsules here, those are alveoli, and then there are blood vessels, which Dr. Cayetano talked about earlier, and there are airways. So the rest of the matrix that's holding them together or supporting them, that's called the interstitium. What is in the interstitium? You can have a few collagen fibers, which uh, help maintain that structure. You can have a few inflammatory cells so that, you know, when you are exposed to any respiratory pathogens or insults, they're there right away to defend your lungs, okay? Um, so basically, interstitial lung disease refers to a disease in that portion of the lung, uh, mainly. However, it can also affect other parts of the lung as well, like the air sacs, the airways, the blood vessels, and also the pleura or the lining of the lungs. So these col this collection of diseases can number over 200. So we're obviously not going to discuss every one of them, but at least help you guys understand the concept of what it is. So how does it manifest? Um, so how do you suspect it? Unfortunately, you know, the symptom for interstitial lung disease is far too common. It's shortness of breath. You can have it with anything. COPD, asthma, um, pulmonary hypertension. So it's really not specific. You can also have cough. So again, this is really not specific as well. So that's when the uh, radiologic manifestations come in. So people can have a certain uh, pattern of inflammation that, or pattern of uh, uh, x-ray findings that uh, can clue us doctors in that, hey, you know what? You probably have an interstitial lung disease. Let's do further testing, okay? Um, they can also do, you can, we can also see on pulmonary function testing. I'm sure maybe some of you have undergone that test already that when they do the lung volume portion of the test, they'll see that your lung capacity is restricted, meaning your lung volumes are smaller than, that, than what they should be. And then further, uh, you can see interstitial lung disease also in the, from a microscopic point of view, because it causes a specific uh, pattern of, uh, it causes specific patterns of inflammation and also fibrosis, which we'll go into later. So see, these are just a few uh, examples. So, where I have the pointer here, this is a very normal chest x-ray. You can see the lungs are very clear. The lungs are the dark areas. The heart is in the middle, okay? So this is the heart. The one on the right, which I have labeled abnormal, is definitely different from this normal x-ray. You can just see in the lungs that there are a lot of white, grainy, hazy opacities. So when the doctor sees that, when you complain of shortness of breath and you see your, let's say, you see your primary care physician, he says, hey, you know what, let's do a chest x-ray and they do a chest x-ray, it looks like this, then he'll be kind of like, hey, you know what, it looks like this is an interstitial lung disease, so we're going to do more testing. So usually that other test that we do beyond the chest x-ray is a CAT scan of the chest. So the CT scan of the chest definitely gives us more resolution um, to see the different structures inside the lungs themselves. You can see the airways, the blood vessels, um, and see what hopefully try to elucidate what pattern of uh, inflammation we have. So this is a CAT scan. So a CAT scan is like an x-ray, but like I said, more resolution. Uh, you can also slice up the body in different ways on CAT scans and take a picture. So this is like a slice through the chest, like you would slice a salami, okay? So this is where I have the pointer here. This is a normal CAT scan. Again, in the middle is the heart. The black areas are the lungs. So anything that's black means there's air. And then these uh, little dots and uh, white lines here, those are blood vessels. So this is normal. 
The one on the right side, which I have labeled abnormal, is very different again. Okay? So you can see over here that in the periphery or the sides of the lungs, you can see all these thickened lines, these bubbles that we call honeycombing. So this one is an example of someone with pulmonary fibrosis. So you, it's very different from a normal lung. And all these thickened lines, those are collagen fibers or scar tissue that stiffens the lungs. That's why your lung capacity is very small. Okay. And then I, at a microscopic level, where I have the pointer here, you can see this is, if you, slide, if you do a microscopic slice of the lung, this is what you'll see under the microscope. So you can see that this area here, that is an alveolus, so that's an air sac. And these are the walls of that air sac, okay? And then maybe up here, it's harder to see, but there are blood vessels and capillaries in there too. Um, but on the right, you can definitely see that the, air, the walls of the air sacs are definitely thickened, okay? And they are not normal. Um, all those, you can s it's hard to see, but if you look closely, there are a lot of blue dots in there. Those are inflammatory cells, those are, so meaning there's a lot of inflammation. The thickening means there's a lot of collagen, so this is fibrosis also on a microscopic level. So when you have fibrosis, when that uh, lining of the lung, well, the lining of the air sacs thicken, uh, people can get short of breath and your oxygen can become low. Because here above, where you have normal gas exchange, so, that, so let's say this is the lining of the air sac, so oxygen and carbon dioxide can exchange freely. But if you have scarring or interstitial lung disease, then you can have thickening of that lining. So the oxygen and carbon dioxide will not diffuse as free as, as before. So people can get short of breath and your oxygen level can drop. Okay. So that's kind of the basic science of interstitial lung disease. So how many people are affected with interstitial lung disease? Uh, you know, before we used to think this is a, you had a question? So before we used to think that this is a very rare disease, but actually, you know, um, because we have all these imaging techniques and we're getting better histories from our patients. So I think we're recognizing interstitial lung diseases a lot more than before. But still, it doesn't affect a lot of people. So it affects about 80.9 per 100,000 men and 67.2 per 100,000 women. So the, there, like I said, there are 200 types of interstitial lung disease, but the most prevalent type you'll probably hear often is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, occupational or environmental lung disease. There's a whole slew of, uh, there's a whole list of disorders that fall under this. Connective tissue disease associated or autoimmune disease associated. So people with uh, lupus, scleroderma, Sjogren's syndrome, um, uh, polymyositis, they can, uh, the autoimmune disease can also affect their lungs. And then sarcoidosis as well uh, can cause interstitial lung disease. Okay. So who, wh what types of people are affected? So it's mainly a disease of adults. So usually pulmonary fibrosis, we see this in people who are 60 years and above, okay? Um, but the mean age is about, four, uh, the range is about from 40 to 70 for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. For autoimmune disease associated uh, interstitial lung disease, uh, you, can ha you can see them in younger adults. So sometimes we can see some uh, young 35, years old, 35 year old uh, people who have had uh, let's say lupus for 10 years and their disease is very much uncontrolled and they become short of breath. So then you do, do an x-ray and you can see interstitial lung disease in these uh, people as well. Some people very rarely though can have familial pulmonary fibrosis and that one you can have at an earlier onset also. But generally um, this is a disease of adults. We don't see this uh, frequently in pediatric patients. So what causes interstitial lung disease? I think this is the most challenging part of interstitial lung disease because you know, we can recognize it with the x-rays, we, we can recognize it with the CAT scans. So when your primary care doctor sees it, they're like, hey, you know what? You should see a pulmonologist. So when you go to the pulmonologist, all these tests may have been done or uh, we will have them done. But I think the main question is, why do I have this interstitial lung, interstitial lung disease? So I think there's, 
at least four major categories. Uh, we also already mentioned autoimmune disease or connective tissue disease associated. So in these people, your own immune system attacks different organs of your body. One of them is the lung, and it can destroy the blood vessels, the lining of the lung, and cause scarring in the, in the lung. Um, number two, exposure to an agent known to cause interstitial lung disease. So this is a broad topic. It can be occupational. It can be drug-induced, so medications, uh, or anything environmental. So occupational, I think you'll... Uh, the one most common that you'll hear is probably asbestosis, okay? but that's not the only one. You can also have uh, berylliosis, silicosis, uh, me uh, metal dust, so a lot of things. So drug-induced, the most common uh, is called bleomycin. Bleomycin is a chem chemotherapeutic agent that is known to cause interstitial lung disease as well. I mean, there are others also like methotrexate and whatnot. Uh, in terms of environment, uh, this is where hypersensitivity pneumonitis plays in. Some of you may have heard this. This is like an extreme allergic response to something inside, the, to an inciting agent in the lungs. So that inciting agent a lot of times could be uh, mold, um, uh, bird feathers, dust, um, some uh, organic dusts like in the farming uh, industry. Um, so those are, there's a lot of examples. The, number, th the no number three is genetic disease. This one we don't see a lot, hermansky pudlak but this is very rare. Number four, I think, which is the most common is idiopathic. So what idiopathic means is unknown. So despite all our testing, despite all our interrogation from you guys, we still don't know why it occurred. So uh, unfortunately, by far, that's the most common. So this is a nice uh, algorithm that goes in our head whenever we see someone with interstitial lung disease. So when we see interstitial lung disease, we've done a history, then we try to elucidate. Do we know the etiology or do we not know the etiology? So if the etiology is not known, then that's where you get the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. And under that, you can have a lot of other diseases. Under that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If you know the etiology, again, we talked about it, um, exposures to uh, environmental or occupational uh, agents such as asbestos, silica, metals, coal dust, birds, hay, mold, uh, some bacteria, um, some smoking, smoking can also cause some smoking-related interstitial lung diseases as well. Um, medications, I mentioned the bleomycin, methotrexate, amiodarone also is a pretty frequent medications that, that is used mainly to control the heart rhythm. Unfortunately, it, is also, uh, it can also cause some toxicity to the lungs as well. Okay. So how does it develop? I think there are two main mechanisms. The first is when you're exposed to an inciting agent or some autoimmune disease, there's inflammation that happens in the interstitium. So when, when, there's infl when the inciting agent gets there, the body sends all these inf inflammatory cells, the white blood cells, to that area. And different white blood cells different, uh, release chemicals that uh, invite more inflammatory cells and cause some certain uh, uh, reactions in order to kill this inciting agent. But unfortunately, just like a, a battlefield, uh, the environment can also be destroyed uh, by this inflammation. Okay, so that's what happens. Uh, your lungs, your the interstitium gets quote unquote destroyed when you have the inflammation from the interstitial lung disease. Then the body tries to heal itself. So that's where fibrosis comes in. So the, the fibrosis is a healing response to injury. But unfortunately, it becomes a disease when the, um, when the body cannot heal it back to normal. So then you, you can have fibrosis in it turns into scar tissue with a thickening of the lining of the lungs, thickening of the lining of the air sacs, then you start having pulmonary fibrosis and dif uh, difficulty because of that. So what if, I, uh, what if you were told that you have this? Let's say, like I said, going back again, you go to your primary care, I have shortness of breath uh, whenever I mow the lawn or whenever I go to the mailbox, I'm very winded. 
and then maybe you can have a cough, dry cough, maybe not, and then your doctor listens to you, hey, you know what, I hear what's called crackles. So crackles are a common finding in uh, interstitial lung disease, but not everyone has it. But what, what, ha what, what it sounds like is like peeling Velcro. So that's basically uh, what you can hear when you have interstitial lung disease. So when, when your doctor hears crackles, then he will say, hey, you know what, you probably have an interstitial lung disease. This, so he'll do an x-ray like I showed you earlier. Hey, you know what, that pattern looks like interstitial lung disease. Let's order the CAT scan. So more specifically, the, it's a special kind of CAT scan. It's called a high resolution CAT, CAT scan so that we can see the different parts of the lung tissue very, um, with, excuse me, with good resolution. So when you, when you go to our office, um, the only thing that I didn't write here is that we will get a very detailed history. So with interstitial lung disease, I think that's what, that's the very important por part of the visit with us is really the history. So you, you don't be surprised if, you know, yeah, it's common for us to ask, hey, you know what, do you smoke, not smoke? Um, then we'll dwell into, hey, you know what, what did you do for work before? And then if the work is not really uh, um, a significant cost, then we'll go like, tell me about your hobbies at home. What do you do? Because some people, you know, at work, they work with computers, so no, really, no real uh, inciting agents there. But when they go home, they like to, um, you know, build a boat, they grind fiberglass every day and whatnot. So um, it's good to get a detailed history. Part of that also we might go into, you know, what kind of pets do you have? I mean, yeah, you can have dogs. A lot of people have dogs, cats. Then I always ask, do you have birds? Okay. Because like I mentioned earlier, uh, exposure to birds can also cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis in some people. Um, so detailed history, we get a CAT scan of the chest, then we send you here for the pulmonary function testing because we want to know what your lung capacity is at now because we'll want to follow that down the line and see are you stable or are you not stable. We can also order blood tests um, this is mainly looking at autoimmune disease to see, hey, you know what, do you have antibodies that would suggest you have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. We can also order blood tests looking at the allergies like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another important part of the visit is checking your oxygen levels. We will check them, you know, at different instances. You know, when, you're, when you come in, uh, they will check your oxygen at rest, but what we often do is say, hey, you know what, I'll have my uh, staff walk you around to and check your oxygen because the oxygen can also drop. You can be normal when sitting down, but when the moment you start exerting yourself, then it will start dropping. Um, the last test I put here is surgical lung biopsy. Um, not everyone is, uh, uh, gets this, but uh, sometimes when the cause is really not known, we don't uh, really we want to have a better sense of what's going on, then we sometimes will say, hey, you know what, we need a surgical lung biopsy. So then we consult a thoracic surgeon uh, to do surgery and take bigger chunks of the lung out so that we can, the pathologist can look under the microscope and see what's going on. Um, but of course, that's a pretty invasive procedure, so we try to reserve that and make sure that we do it for the right reasons. So how can we prevent it? So I talked about inciting agent a lot. So the, the common sense will tell us that, you know, we should identify and avoid exposure to the inciting agent. Um, so let's say it's, it's a bird. Unfortunately, we'll have to tell you, hey, you know what? We'll have to get rid of that cockatiel, unfortunately. Or, um, you know, I've, I've asked someone before, do you have birds at home? No. But the husband said, hey, you know what, did you feed the chickens today? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, you'll have to stop feeding the chickens too, something like that. Um, but uh, so let's say occupational exposures. You were exposed to asbestos, let's say, 40 years ago. Unfortunately, when you in inhale asbestos fibers, they're, they're not digested by your body. They kind of stay in there. So the inflammation, you know, is slow slowly developing in there and unfortunately there's no way to, you can avoid further exposure but the inciting agent is still there. 
unfortunately, if it's idiopathic, which is the most common, we don't know. So we don't know what to avoid. Okay? But uh, studies have shown that you know, smoking increases the risk of progression. Acid reflux also um, is associated with poorer outcomes. So generally what we say is, hey, you know what, we have to stop smoking. Oh, you're having acid reflux at night too, we have to treat that as well. Okay. So how is it treated, so specifically for interstitial lung disease? Again, going back to that uh, mechanism of how interstitial lung develops, inflammation and fibrosis. So there are people who pre predominantly still have the inflammation. So when they have the inflammation there, then we say, hey, you know what? We probably have to bring down that inflammation. And the way you do that is through steroids, prednisone, okay? or immunosuppressants. Some of you may have heard some of these immunosuppressants. Some may be called Celsep, azathioprine, um, methotrexate, okay? Um, but this does not apply to all types of interstitial lung disease, okay? So if more specifically, let's say, you know, if you have an autoimmune disease that there's a lot of inflammation, then yes, it might help. If you have a sarcoidosis where there's a lot of inflammation also, yes, th this might help. But if it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, so we're jumping to the other spectrum here, which is fibrosis already, so meaning it has scarred up. So there, there, there have been studies before which have tried steroids plus immunosuppressants, but it really didn't help. So we don't really, when someone has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we don't really jump to the steroids immun and uh, immunosuppressants. So which I will go to antifibrotic medications. So these are a newer type of medica medication that has uh, come into the market in 2014. It's been available in Asia and Europe uh, several years before that, but uh, it's been approved in 2014. There's two of them. One is uh, perfenidone, one is nintedanib. So basically their, their mechanism of action is uh, different, but basically what they do is they slow down progression of fibrosis. Um, so let's say perfenidone, okay, how does it translate to patients uh, if we put you on this medication? So it, you get improved progression-free survival, so meaning you survive longer with less progression. Uh, it reduces risk of disease pro progression by as much as 30%, that number may vary. Uh, nintedanib is also a medication that's antifibrotic also. Uh, it also reduces disease progression and slows the decline of lung function as well. But then again, I have to uh, specify the, both these medications have been approved mainly for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So if you have interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis from sarcoid, these do not apply. If you have interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis from lupus, this does not apply too. Okay. So the next, uh, aside from medications, is oxygen. Um, so we prescribe oxygen when the levels dip below 88% when you're resting or when walking or even at night. So the pros is that for, for interstitial lung disease, it does improve breathlessness and, breathlessness and some of the fatigue. But of course, uh, uh, some of you may know it is cumbersome. you sure we have newer devices that are more portable and easier to, to bring around, but um, it takes some getting used to uh, to be on oxygen therapy 24-7. Pulmonary rehabilitation. So pulmonary rehabilitation uh, is not only helpful for people with COPD or emphysema, but it's also very helpful for, for people with pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. So basically it involves exercise training, breathing exercises. There's a lot more to this that I didn't mention. But the goal is really to restore your ability to function without extreme breathlessness. Okay. Uh, it improves exercise capacity and health-related quality of life. Okay. So it's not only for people with COPD, it's appli applicable for people with pulmonary fibrosis as well. Lung transplantation. Um, so lung transplantation, you know, currently it's the only option that will actually prolong survival in patients with advanced interstitial lung disease, or I should say end-stage interstitial lung disease or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the thing is, you know, uh, for lung transplantation, 
Usually they do this in people younger than age 65 without significant medical conditions. But I put here that it's really center dependent because it really depends uh, which university is doing it. So if, let's say, you do it in University of Washington or Duke University who do m hundreds of these cases a year, then uh, their outcomes are actually better uh, versus uh, centers who do maybe 10 of these a year, then the outcomes might not be better. There's a lot of uh, things that can improve with lung transplantation. There's a lot of advancements uh, in terms of uh, available lungs for donation because I think that's the big, uh, that's the big uh, hurdle in lung transplantation. We just don't have enough of them available. Okay, so um, one of the newer uh, things that they have, they have been developing is something called the ex vivo lung where you know they have lungs that are donated but they're not really optimal to, to be transplanted yet because let's say they had a pneumonia so they can put it it's a little bit of sci-fi but they put it in a little uh, I shouldn't say dish but <laughs> it's like in a little um, dome and uh, they're running blood through the lung, uh, oxygenating it. So they're trying to rehabilitate it out of the body so that it will be suitable for transplant. So those are one of the advancements there. Um, so yes, lung transplantation is a good option, but it doesn't apply to everyone also, uh, unfortunately. So the last is also palliative care. So palliative care is medical treatment focused on relieving and preventing symptoms that are bothersome and distressing. You know, like the s extreme shortness of breath, if the pulmonary rehab cannot help with that, sometimes you have to resort to palliative care. This is a um, multi-aspect um, way of taking care of someone. So they deal with the physical, psychosocial, spiritual factors. Um, they also deal with advanced care planning, so to talk about goals of care as your disease progresses. Um, a lot of people will think maybe, you know, once we people refer you to palliative care, maybe this is the end. It's not always the case. It's really, you know, what I mentioned up front is really focusing on relieving and preventing symptoms that are bothersome and distressing. So, yeah. Um, so that is the end of my talk. I try to keep it as uh, simple as I could, but... Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask me.